of all, I'd like to ask about is, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, what you were doing today. This was an awful lot of fun with these uh, really brilliant young people here. Mm -hmm. How long have you been doing the, the Young Poets uh, competition? 28 years. This is the 28th year. Did it start with you? Yes. It's called the Illinois Poet Laureate Awards Competition. I was invited to be a Poet Laureate in January of 1968, and I felt, people kept saying, what does a Poet Laureate do? And I was told when I was asked to uh, take this honor, accept this honor, that uh, my duties would be commensurate with my pay, which is nothing. <laughs> and I'm very glad to have it nothing because that gives me an opportunity to think of things on my own to do. And I'm, I'm under nobody's official supervision. What do you get from, from working with these young people in terms of their energy and their imagination? Well, I wish there had been such a competition when I was a little girl, because I started writing when I was seven. And uh, there was nothing of this sort. Wasn't an interest in the schools either in uh, creative writing. So I remember once uh, I put a little f uh, extra flair into my composition. Might have been history, might have been English. And the teacher said, where did you get that? You couldn't possibly have thought of that all by yourself. Where did you steal it? So then my mother came up to school and she said, uh, she doesn't have to steal. She can write better than you can. You wouldn't have expected her to say that. She was such a sweet, gentle little woman. <laughs> but she was right. When did you, you say you started writing when you were seven? My mother told me that I brought her a page of rhymes when I was seven years old. And she was so proud of me, and she said, you are going to be the lady Paul Lawrence Dunbar. You've probably heard of that very famous uh, poet, perhaps the first black poet to become truly famous uh, in many places. There were Dunbar societies around the country. Where yes, I think there still are. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that in our old yearbooks at the university. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what really got you started? What, what inspired you to write poetry? Well, it might have been because I had a father. Both my parents were uh, interested in creativity and, and the arts. And uh, my father would sing to my brother and myself. He would sing uh, wonderful songs like Asleep in the Deep. <laughs> and. Uh, Sometimes on a stage I'll try to imitate it, but I won't at this point. And because uh, I can't go down as far as he did. But uh, he would tell us wonderful stories at bedtime, you know. He was one of those ideal fathers really interested in their children. And uh, I think it was only. Uh, natural that one of us would have wanted to try to put some of that magic on paper. My brother was a very good painter. He didn't uh, give the attention to his art that he should have done. And he died uh, a long time ago. When did, when did you know that uh, poetry was going to be your profession, your, your vocation in life? Well, I didn't use such words. I never said vocation, profession. I just knew that I would write and keep writing uh, as long as I was here, whether my writing was published or not. Uh, yes. There was an immediate advantage, however, because when I was writing a poem, my brother had to wash the dishes. Of course, when he was painting a picture, I would have to wash the dishes because there was the, that same interest in uh, a child that was 
wanting to do something special. That's very good that your parents were able to see the importance of that and mm -hmm. inspire you both to do that. Indeed. My, my father gave my mother a bookcase, which is now in my bedroom, a bookcase with the Harvard classics in it. That w was his idea of a wedding present. Doesn't that indicate that he was a very special person? Sure does. Um, you met some incredible people on your way up. Langston Hughes, mm. he took an interest in your work. Can you talk about the kind of relationship that you had with him? Well, when I was 16, he came to read at our church, uh, Metropolitan Community Church. Gee, I feel guilty saying that. I haven't been there in quite a while. But um, uh, my mother insisted that I take some poems to the reading and show them to him after uh, his offering. And uh, when everybody was gone, we approached him. He read them. Uh, he was one of the kindest hearted persons you would want to know. Many writers will be able to tell you that. And uh, he said, you're talented. Keep writing. Someday you'll have a book published. I met him uh, when I was a married woman later on. I remember giving a, my husband and I gave a party in a two-room kitchenette for him. Squeezed 75 people into that party. And he said it was the best party he had ever been to. <laughs> and a couple of weeks later, he came by our little two-room kitchenette and mounted the long flight of stairs that I described in my longish poem, uh, The Sundays of Satin Leg Smith, and uh, knocked on the door. Those were the days when you did things like that. You didn't call up and say, I'm coming. Just knocked on the door, and uh, we let him in, <laughs> and we served him our dinner, which was uh, mustard greens, corn, um, um, ham hocks, and cornbread, and he loved it. It's a very natural, easy person to know and talk with. How has Chicago influenced your work, the things you see in life? You described yourself a minute ago in the interview with that young man down there as a people's poet. Well, no. No, I think I was careful to say a people poet, people. which is very different from a people's poet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't exactly know what that means. <laughs> okay. But I am interested in, I'm fascinated by what people do. and. Uh, their responses to this and to that. So I find myself writing about people more often than I find myself writing about daisies and dandelions, although I am interested in those also. Why do people, why do people bring that out in you? Why, why are they uh, your favorite subjects? Well, for instance, it's fascinating to uh, sit here and wonder what you're thinking is this <laughs> about this little episode. Sure. And uh, I could use my imagination, you know, and come up with something perhaps quite special. Well, I'm thinking about it as I might sit down and write some of my own poetry. <laughs> yes, you very <laughs> well might. <laughs> Because I will probably do that. I love to write. I, I just started a little bit. I, I love I it. I see. Uh, you did write when you were a youngster, didn't you? A little bit. Mm -hmm. A little bit. But I'm doing it more now that I, I guess I know a little bit more about things, maybe. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wish I'd started earlier. Uh -huh. Well, you're still very young. Just yeah. keep going, I would advise you. <laughs> Wait a minute, now. she's turning the I'll table. start she's interviewing, interviewing you. She's interviewing <laughs> me now. That's, I don't know if that's fair, but it's a lot of fun. Um, some of the things that uh, you said to the kids today, I'd like to ask you about that, if that's mm -hmm. okay. You said that um, 
Poetry is a friend to whom you can say, to whom you can say too much. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? Yes. You can uh, say just so much to any uh, uh, human friend. <laughs> but uh, everything can come out on that paper. You can put down anything that occurs to you. Uh, well, at least I feel that way. I do meet a good many poets who say they cannot write down everything that they're thinking. Somebody might see it, <laughs> but they don't want to see it. But I feel if you're that timid, you're not really uh, a writer. What does it mean to be a writer to you? I was asked that question earlier. And uh, what I can say is that I simply never thought of it in such terms. After my mother told me I was going to be the lady poet, <laughs> the lady Dunbar, I believed every word she said. Of course, I know now that no one wants to be uh, like another poet. You want to be your, yourself. Be yourself, I say, you know little book for children who want to write poetry uh, called Very Young Poets. Be yourself. Do not imitate other poets. You are as important as they are. Now, many children are quite astonished to have me tell them that they're just as important as uh, Shakespeare and Sylvia Plath and Charles Simic, uh, especially Charles Simic. And, um, yeah. Name some, think of some of your favorites. P.S. Eliot. That's, what, that's still one of my favorites, too. Pablo Neruda. I like to read the language, but I can't say I love his poetry. Do you know the poetry of um, uh, Okot Pipitek? No. He was... Uh, Oh, well, he's an African poet. Where was he born? In uh, God, I think. He has books called uh, Song of Lawino and Song of Oko, O C O L. And uh, Lawino is the wife rooted in the past. She doesn't like modern ways, and he is just the opposite. Each one has a long, narrow poem. And uh, if I were forced to, I believe I would say that Oko Tibete is uh, my favorite poet, if I had to say that. Though I think that's a very uh, a bad thing to feel that you must say, uh, because every poet worth his or her salt <laughs> has got something special for the world. Well, I'm not going to ask it in terms of why he may be your favorite poet, but what in Humor, his poetry, I can tell what, you. Yeah. What, in his, what in his poetry speaks to you? Um, the humor of it, the sassiness of it, the um, absolute honesty of it, the way of looking at... Um, what's in this world, frankly. <laughs> I'm not putting it very well at all, but I certainly do recommend him to you. Well, a lot of people would say the same thing about your poetry because I've seen, I've seen some that's very lean, very sparse, but yet it gets the point across in very, very few words. Hmm. Well, that's good when it is true, but I have some very, very long, pretty poems. I have In the Mecca, which is half a book long. I have Winnie, which has its own little book. That's in, um, I'm writing about uh, Winnie Mandela there. I think she's a much underrated person. And uh, I've never met her, but I feel I do not want to meet her now because I spent the whole summer on this little book 
And I really believe I have got the real Winnie Mandela. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to run any risk of being disappointed. I don't think I would be, though. It's been said of your work that poetry is distilling life. And you called it in front of the kids a while ago. You called it a delicious agony. Yes, writing is a delicious agony. Wanting so much to get down on that paper what is in you, screaming or purring or whatever. And it's difficult. When do you know that you've been successful, that you've gotten it right? Mm. When do you know that? That is a question that I'm often asked, that everybody is asked. Um, it's not a mystery for me. I know before I start writing what it, what it is I want to achieve. So when I have achieved that, that I wanted to achieve, I stop. Many youngsters tell me, though, that they don't know when to stop that they go on and on and on. And I recommend uh, my uh, idea to them that they know before they start writing what it is they want to say. Well, you can overwrite something. You can overpaint something. You know, you should know when yes, I'm sure that's yeah. true. Um, what, does, what does your poetry do to explain and I know you, you don't like the term African American, uh, but what does it, uh, what does your poetry do to help tell the story of black people in America? The, well, there are lots of stories. There's not just one black story. And you talk to ten blacks, and you might have ten, <coughs> for, I mean, different kinds of poem. I write a, uh, there might be a person I know happens to be black. <laughs> Blackness has some degree of uh, specialness for every black person. So every black person can tell you a different story. I don't like African American because it denies uh, so many of us. Oh, I don't know if I can do this or not. Stop me if this is not the thing to do. I wanted to quote from a um, report from part two. What is it? I said, well, you go right ahead and find what you Oh, want. all right. Okay. And, uh, Family hood. The current motion to make the phrase African American an official identification is cold and excluding. What of our family members in Ghana, in Tanzania, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Brazil? Why are we pushing them out of our consideration? out of our concern. The capitalized names black and blacks were appointed to comprise an open, sensitizing, wide-stretching, unifying, empowering umbrella. And I, that's the way I see it. I feel that uh, blacks should consider themselves family. And uh, People in Brazil do not, cannot come under that uh, African-American umbrella, nor people in South Africa. About South Africa, there's something very interesting. When uh, white South Africans come over here to join America, then they are African-Americans. And I've said that to a couple of them. And they didn't like the idea at all. <laughs> <laughs> I like what you have to say about that. But I did want to stress that idea of 
family. And I think all blacks should be interested in whatever is happening to blacks in any part of the world. That was something that was very, uh, uh, very powerful that came through with these young people today. Because some of those kids were talking about experiences that I, as an adult, a lot of people should never have to know about as kids. Uh -huh. Losing losing friends, losing family to yes. violence. Um, Being afraid to go out on your own street. How do you think putting that into poetry and setting that into verse is a way of uh, uh, calling attention to, to those problems in our lives? Um, you don't object to it, do you? Oh, not at all. No, no, I think it's wonderful that the kids are doing that. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, um, is this a, how does this serve as a way to help people understand that this is a real problem and that, uh, we ought to be doing more about it? It they might say such as that to some people, but others, I'm afraid, it just floats over their heads. I guess that's what I was talking about. At least about. you're keeping me. Have you started again? Yes, we have. Uh, there were some very powerful things in what those kids were saying. And how does that make you feel as, as someone who's, I suppose, giving a wider voice to, to, to what those children are feeling? There was a little, the young girl who uh, wrote about how she felt about her sister having a baby at the age of 14. And uh, I thought that was a very powerful and sensitive poem with several layers to it. And um, she didn't have any answer at the end, perhaps you remember. She spoke of how the baby, she wished her sister could empathize with that, with that baby and she wished she could empathize with herself. She would like to, uh, she wanted her to know how she felt. She didn't go any further than that. She didn't say, I feel thus and so. But it left it wide open to the imagination and perhaps the knowledge of readers. Sometimes there aren't any easy answers. No, there isn't any there. You can just, it makes you see that household, doesn't it? And uh, hear the arguments that must be going on between the sisters. You can make up whole stories. The sister might want, um, uh, the, the, the young mother might want her sister to uh, take care of the baby. And you could just imagine what, oh, what among many things she might reply to that desire. That's true of so many of those poems. They're many layered. Yeah. I, I, got that out of, I got that out of a lot of them. That, uh, they were operating on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. And those were kids who were dealing with things that I've never, thank God, never had to deal with. And my heart went out to them. Yes. Are you publishing those in the book? You're talking about that. Um, oh, that's going to be a lot of work. See, these go back uh, 28 years. <laughs> I have kept them. They are, they've broken out the back of a cabinet that I've got to replace this summer. But I kept them all in one place. So they certainly should be gone through and the best of them brought out. But it ought to be a big book. I heard a book there this afternoon, you know. What's that? I heard a book this afternoon. Certainly you did. Uh -huh. And there's a book every year. <laughs> there were so many more of those poems I would have loved to read, but I couldn't take up the time. But there are some special, special poems that have come to this competition. As poet laureate, as a, as a Pulitzer Prize winner, Lincoln laureate, um, <laughs> There's a there's a long list of there's a long list of honors that you've uh, 
that you have. Uh, well, I've lived long enough for that to happen. And written well enough. And, um, Thank you. What, but what in your life has made you the most happy? What's brought you the most satisfaction? Oh, having children. I can always answer that easily and quickly. Having children is such a wonderful thing, or at least I found it so. Uh, watching them change almost from minute to minute. <laughs> and uh, We had a good time with our children, my husband and I. We have uh, a son also who's 56, <laughs> old enough to be your father. <laughs> Barely, but could be. <laughs> And uh, we had, as in my own uh, first home, we had dinner every evening. My husband would come home, we would sit down to dinner at about six o'clock. And we would talk, we had such wonderful table con conversations. Talk about what had happened to each one of us during the day. It was, oh, I could just go on and on and on about that. We had fun. We'd go out driving, go out to um, uh, Morton's Arboretum. <laughs> Every season we'd do that. You read some of your, your late husband's poetry there. I particularly yes. like Autumn. I really love that. I'm going to give you a copy, the copy. I still have it here. And I want you to read the long poem called My Daddy. You might not like the title, but it's very, very special and sensitive. And it's large. It's a little classic. What was it like to, to be married to someone who was also, in, who was also a poet? Uh, you talked about how the children were involved in everything. Um, did that help your creativity and thus his? I think so, and it made the children creative too. Or maybe they would have been just naturally, but uh, they loved having the writers we knew come to the house and they would talk to them. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else can I say about that? Um, my husband was very uh, proud of me, and he always said, don't worry about sweeping. You get the idea for a poem, sit down, write it. Don't think about uh, sleeping or cooking or dusting. <laughs> it was very understanding in that way and couldn't be happier when... Uh, now, I'm not saying... I mean, he was a human being. Of course, he might have uh, thought in the early times that he would like some of the things that were happening to me happen to him. But he very soon decided he didn't, he was more interested in, um, well, prose writing and more than that, social science. So he has a big, well, he has one big novel about 750 pages long. And I promised him if he didn't get that book published, I would. <laughs> and I mean to do whatever I can to see that that happens. There's something that comes through, though, in all of what we've been talking about, that there have always been people who encouraged you. And you are, yes. you in turn are doing the same. You're trying to... I feel that's a debt. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Why, mm -hmm. why is well, it for instance, I wish there had been such a contest as I have when I was a, a young girl. Uh, there was nothing of the sort. I was encouraged, though, by one of the editors of... Um, uh, the Chicago Defender, his name was Dan Burley, and he edited a, po a column called Lights and Shadows. And I started sending poems to that, and he was very excited. He thought that I was quite talented, encouraged me to keep sending more, and ultimately I had 75 poems published <laughs> in that column. So he was my first uh, black encourager. Well, except for Langston Hughes, whom I had met at 16. But I was doing this at, uh, pretty near that age. Yeah. Are there any, uh, I, it's probably unfair to ask, but I'll give it a shot anyway. <laughs> Is there any particular poem or book of poetry that uh, 
you would put among your favorites? Well, I mentioned Old Coat uh, mm -hmm. Pipitec. I don't quite know, let me tell you. I don't quite know how to pronounce that. But I thought it was Oak Coat Patek. And I was at the University of Wisconsin, and you know how hip some of those <laughs> students are. And um, a young fellow was sitting next to me, young black fellow. And uh, I was talking about my love for this poet. And uh, I said, and his name is Oko Pitet. <laughs> I thought the P was supposed to be said. He said, yes, I too have an interest in the poetry of Oko Pitet. <laughs> so ever since then, I've, oh, well, well, I just want to share that with you. Uh, did I answer the question at all? Well, I was asking, I was asking about your own poem. Stands out to you, or you're obviously you're still writing among my own poems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I tend to like a part of this book, a part of another, but I would feel that a street in Bronzeville, uh, the Bean Eaters, maybe especially, uh, in the Mecca, and uh, Winnie, and I do have an interest in uh, children coming home. So you see, I can't pick out just one but those perhaps are my favorites. You were talking about children coming home. Tell me about why that was so, why that's so special to you, because it has a lot of different meanings for what uh, kids may be coming home to. If you don't mind, do I'll read mind you a poem that will give you an idea of what I mean. This poem is called well, th there are almost two titles because I put the name of the child speaking up in the corner. And here, the name is Merle, M-E-R-L-E. -E. He is talking. He's a boy. <laughs> a lot of people have thought that was a girl, but no, that would really dis destroy what I'm saying here. And the title is Uncle Seagram, Uncle Seagram. And when I'm reading this at, on campus, as I often say, uh, you know that there are many strange parents who name their children after whiskeys. And we do have uh, Calvert, and we have Johnny Walker. You've met, I've met such people. <laughs> and here is Uncle Seagram. My uncle likes me too much. I am five and a half years old and in kindergarten. In kindergarten, everything is clean. My uncle is six feet tall with seven bumps on his chin. My uncle is six feet tall and he stumbles. He stumbles because of his wonderful medicine packed in his pocket all times. Family is ma and pa and my uncle three brothers, three sisters, and me. Every night at my house, we play checkers and dominoes. My uncle sits close. There aren't any shoes or socks on his feet. Under the table, a big toe tickles my ankle. Under the oil cloth, his thin knee beats into mine and mashes and mashes. When we look at TV, my uncle picks me to sit on his lap. As I sit, he gets hard in the middle. I squirm, but he keeps me and kisses my ear. I am not even a girl. Once when I went to the bathroom, my uncle noticed, came in, shut the door put his long white tongue in my ear and whispered, we're best friends and family and we know how to keep secrets. My uncle likes me too much. I am worried. I do not like my uncle anymore. Well, 
I never read that poem at a, uh, an elementary school or a high school without uh, somebody coming up later and saying, uh, that's happening in my home or that has happened in my family. So I tell them, confide in your teachers, you know. Perhaps some help can be found for you. Yes. <laughs> You're still writing? Oh, yes, I'll keep writing. That doesn't mean that I finish a poem every day, but there's no day that I don't put notes to paper, some impression of what has, what has happened to me or to others that day, what I've seen and felt. What might give you an idea? Looking at TV, somebody will say something stupid, <laughs> and I'll write a response to it immediately, because I always have a pen and a tablet ready. <laughs> Is there or something a... beautiful, of course. Oh. Well, I saw some um, poets, several poets. Uh, one was Rita Dove. One was, a, well, a novelist, too, uh, N. Scott Mamaday. And I'm trying to remember why I'm going to fail here, I'm sure. Can't remember. But he said something exquisite. And uh, it inspired a piece of poetry that I'm going to continue. It's not finished yet. Is there advice? Or you'll listen to one of those nature programs. And, uh, you know, the ones that have music, maybe you feel that that's just a, a little prissy. But, <laughs> but I love them. I love to see those, uh, those nature spots and uh, mountains and rivers and listen to the classical music. And they inspire ideas and uh, pieces of language that I can work with later on. <laughs> what advice do you give to young poets about, about learning their, their craft? Well, of course, I tell them they must read, must read everything, and that includes Newsweek and uh, Time and Jet. I have black friends who refuse to read Jet. <laughs> but um, there, is, there is so much in any issue of Jet that you need to know about your people. And uh, there is a lot of inspiration for poetry and fiction. So I believe in reading everything Read between the lines, though, I always urge youngsters. Oldsters need to be told that, too. But I'm coming to the end of this uh, all too soon, I'm afraid. But um, Why would you encourage people to write poetry? Mm. Helps them to uh, come to grips with certain aspects of themselves. Uh, to write it and to read it, both are important. What has given you the most pleasure out of being a poet yourself? Mm. Well, I could easily say expressing what I feel, putting down on pa paper, seeing it there, what I have been feeling, and feeling satisfied that uh, at least some great part of what I felt <coughs> or thought is there for others to uh, look at, enjoy, maybe even learn from. But that is not why I would uh, tell a poet to write a poem. Uh, no, that's not a good reason. I think the reason should be very personal. To satisfy yourself. Okay. 
Yes, that's what I'm doing when I'm in the actual process of writing, trying to satisfy myself. But once I have finished and said, it's done, then I'm happy to share it with others. There was a very famous poet, oh, what was that poet's name? It started with an E, and he had a son. He was involved with the University of Chicago. His son was named after him. Very famous playwright and poet. We were at the Art Institute with uh, other authors at a um, round table discussion. And uh, we were all asked to say what made us write. He said, I write only for myself. I do not write for any other people, just myself. So I sprang up. I guess I'm still a little sassy now, but then I had a lot of uh, uh, sassiness. And I said, um, that is not true, because if that were true, we wouldn't know anything about you, because you would have written, satisfied yourself, and put those expert pieces, because he was very famous, <laughs> in um, uh, uh, a, a drawer at home, your desk. Uh, you wouldn't have bothered to show them to anybody. I said, yet we all know about you. You went and got those things published. So you do care about uh, impressing others. He got very red. He was able to get red. <laughs> Thank you. I have certainly enjoyed this. This has been wonderful. Well, you made it possible for me to enjoy it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I know I've said a lot of silly things. I said a lot of good things. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you'll cut all those out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. This Bless your so heart. Much fun. Thank you for I helping sure. me through this. <laughs> I know you don't like to do it. 